Cool. We'll see you later on. All right, guys, let's talk about UTIs again. Okay, so no more talking, please. Uh, UTIs, very common. I want you guys to understand that for the elderly, this hits them a lot harder than your conventional um, early adults or late adults. Well, not late adults, but um, older adults get affected by this um, a lot more drastically than we do. Uh, something that I want you guys to write down is usually there's a change in level of consciousness. Okay, the patient, ha of course, it's going to have all the other elements as well, but usually a change, of co uh, a, a, a change of level of consciousness lets us know that this patient might have some type of infection, and it's very common when they have a UTI. Um, that acidic question on the exam, how was that one? What did you guys put? Why did you guys put 7.4? It's 6. The book says 4.6 to 8, right? Okay. And I kept telling you guys, it's slightly acidic, like not 7.2, like below 7. So that's where Mr. Hernandez came in and helped you guys out with that specific question. Now, listen to me, guys. Stop talking so much, please. The, the issue is this. I told you guys. So, I mean, I understand the question is tricky, but that's why I went in and I intervened and I gave you guys some extra elements so you guys could understand. <coughs> it's 6.0. 4.2 is too low. That's almost as acidic as a stomach. Okay. 7.4. By definition, it's slightly acidic. My goodness, it is. But what did Mr. H said? Not, not 7.2, guys. I'm talking about less than that. About, I said 6.8 is what I said. But like, just let you know it's below. So I want you guys to, uh, if, you, if like half of the class got that wrong, I'm not going to count it against you guys. Because by definition, that's correct. 7.4 is within that variable. That, but, but listen to what I'm telling you guys during the lecture, because that's going to help you guys out as well. OK? What was that? The question That's why I said it's slightly acidic. But you didn't say that. I didn't did didn't say that. Normal range. Oh, you guys should have hopefully figured out. How many of you guys put six? And that just goes based on what I just really emphasized, guys. Okay. All right. I probably won't give it back. Mr. H. All right. My definition is. Shh. Uh, yes. Silly. Oh, okay. All right, so anyway, uh, pH is mildly acidic. Um, UTIs usually are the most common nosocomial infections, meaning hospital-acquired infections. Um, who's mostly susceptible, male or female? Female. Yeah. Female. How long is your urethra in a female? Two, 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 two inches long. Okay. One and a half. Okay. Wait, let's be specific. How long is it? Actually, it varies for every single woman. I could bring three people up here right now, and I guarantee you it's not the same on all three of you. All right. Uh, usually causes by, caused by bladder obstructions, folks, or, or on um, infrequent <laughs> emptying of the bladder, meaning if you're retaining fluids, because you, you guys have a question back then? No. You, no, if you guys have a question, ask me. No, we just asking how long you said it was. Yeah. For what? Oh, for female? It's by the textbook answer is one and a half to two. It's about two inches long. It's a lot shorter. No. Is that what I said? Yeah. One and a half? Yeah. I said one and a half? I always say one and a half to two inches. And the book says one and a half to two inches. I'm not recording this session. Sorry, guys. Okay. So anyway, guys, um, you guys have to understand that infrequent bladder emptying will cause a UTI. And also, I'm, I'm sorry, I am going to talk about this. If I say one and a half inches, guys, what's the big difference between one and a half and two inches? Nothing. What's happening? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so insufficient bladder emptying is very important for you guys to understand. If you're not urinating often enough because you're having uh, some form of incontinence, but not that you're going, but that you're retaining fluids, that may lead to a UTI as well. Uh, decreased bactericidal secretions from the prostate for males, okay? That also has to do with the male hormone, and we're gonna talk today about what happens when a male has hypertrophic uh, prostati prostitis. Um, the prostate gets enlarged, what type of um, interventions do we perform? Uh, perennial soling in females, in particular in females, because they don't have to sit in that feces or in that urine for too long for that bacteria to form and actually creep up there. And of course, sexual intercourse, what do we have the patient do afterwards? Mix ready, you guys sound fancy. Oh, let's go back. Are we gonna have yes, ma'am. Every day.
day. Or every Tuesday. Wait, don't. That's a right answer. Edgar, you have a question now? Okay. Explain it later or ask me. Okay? Please. We good? Again, manifestations, urgency. Uh, they feel like they always have to go. Uh, frequency, burning on urination. Uh, nocturia, and I also, I also talked about the element, remember to offer a bedpan. You guys see that anywhere today? Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is why I, you know, I put those elements in there, folks. Bless you. Uh, abdominal discomfort, uh, perennial or back pain is very common as well. You guys know that uh, if a patient has a UTI, it can travel up the urinary system, right? Okay, and it'll cause an inflammation or infection in the higher portions of the, of the urinary tract, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So the urine is usually cloudy, blood-tinged urine. Also, what color did I say it was? Amber. Amber. Do you guys see that on the test somewhere? Yes. Okay. Um, there was no answer for it. There was no urinary tract infection. I wanted you guys to understand the concept. Yeah. Um, what was the question that they asked you today about the scenario and where the patient has 120 mLs, and they have clear urine. They had history of, ret of urinary retention, but they had a Foley catheter placed in. And then what do you do? Monitor. You monitor the patient. Monitor. And a lot, of, a lot of people got a little confused because the minimum is 50 mLs per hour. Yeah. And it had 120. But remember, the patient had urinary retention. So now that they have the catheter placed in, in two hours, 120 versus 100, I mean, really, 20 mLs? No. So that's why is you continue to monitor the patient. And then they ask you a question about that specific uh, scenario. What, what's the only element that puts the patient at risk? Infection. Uh, infection, because the patient has a Foley catheter. But the standard would be highly infection risk, right? Well, depend, there's so many yeah. ways to put it down. Yeah, and I don't think any of those um, really put out Ananda. They just told you what it was. Yeah. Um, so you do a UACNS, you need about 10 mLs, you guys also saw that somewhere yeah. in there today? Yes? Yes, it would, depending on the situation. However, when we try to promote um, um, autonomy and we try to promote, see, if you give a patient a, a bed pad, a pad, excuse me, uh, on a condensed pad, that means they're going to soil themselves. So it's much, much better to give them a bed pan because they're not going to soil themselves. You don't have to change the pad afterwards or the patients don't have to sit on their incontinence pad. And that's, that's where you get confused with real world versus theory. <laughs> Theoretically speaking, do we always do that? Do we, at night shift, do we tell our 10 or 12, 14 no. patients, let me give you a, a bed pan? No. We give them a, an incontinence pads. I understand that, but if you're giving them an incontinence pad, that's putting them at, at higher risk for UTIs, for skin breakdown. So that's why you want to offer the bedpan. That's the that's the best answer. But, but when it comes to those two, which one's better? Bedpan. Bedpan always better. Yeah. Uh, you want to clean the meatus and separate the labia while avoiding. You guys see that question too? Okay. You see how I kind of inject all these elements in there? And it's stuff that you guys have to know. It's stuff that you really have to know. <clears throat> um, medical management, um, antibiotics. There's a medication I want you guys to write down called Bactrim. Bactrim, B-A-C-T-R-I-M, Bactrim. This one kills fungus, bacteria, protozoa. It kills all of them, okay? It's very commonly used, Bactrim, B-A-C-T-R-I-M. Pardon me? Yeah. This is, no, that, I, I'm just talking about, this is an antibiotic medication that we give for a lot of different things. We can use it for UTIs as well. Okay, however, if we do a UACNS and we find out that it's a specific pathogen, we give that specific medication. And these are all concepts that I want you guys to understand. Bactrim can be given for a UTI, it can be given for some type of other infection that you may develop as well. 
but you guys understand the concept that we, we treat infections based on their host, uh, uh, based on their pathogen. And just understanding those concepts is really uh, essential. <coughs> Bactrim is a common medication we give. So if you ever hear the word Bactrim, you know it's an antibacterial medication, antifungal medication, okay? You always want to encourage fluids. How, many, how much fluids do you want to encourage? Normally, how much does a person take on an average day? 1,600 to 2,000? 1,500. That's a good estimate. Usually, we're supposed to drink about 2,000 mLs a day, give or take a few hundred, right? A patient that you want it, that has a potential UTI, what do you want to do to them? Increase to how much? 3,000. How you can give them 4,000 if they're also uh, potentially dehydrated. So yeah, you want to give them at least 3,000 mLs. What other element do you want to include in the oral intake to, de to increase acidity and decrease the likelihood of cranberry juice? Cranberry juice. That's really important for you guys to know as well, so make sure you guys write that down. Okay, and again, perennial care, you want to wipe from front to back. Can a urinary obstruction lead to a UTI? Yes. Yes. Yeah, because you're not emptying out as often as you normally would. Um, the thing with urinary obstructions, it could be a, a stricture, meaning the urethra can be uh, too tight. Okay, it could be something as simple as that. It could be kinks. It could be cyst tumors, which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. It could be calculi. What's calculi? Stones. stones. Okay, stones. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. It could be cholesterol. It could be um, uric acid. Like, like what, what, do you guys remember gout? Yeah. Okay, it could be those elements as well. It could be calcium. And prostatic hypertrophy, meaning the prostate gets enlarged and it produces um, pressure on the urethra, hence you have difficulty urinating. These patients will have a uh, continuous need to void. Again, they'll void small amount, but very frequently. What sets these patients aside? A urinary obstruction from a uh, urinary tract infection. What's the difference between the manifestations of a burning urinary burning. obstruction versus burning your, sensation. the burning sensation? Yeah, the burning sensation. Okay, and of course the patient will develop pain, nausea. May I switch the slide? spoke about indwelling catheters, suprapubic cystostomies, um, ureterostomy. A ureterostomy, where are we performing this ostomy? Ureter. Ureter. Good, good. Nephrostomy at the kidney. We spoke about the basket of, uh, extraction. Yeah, it's this right here. I spoke about this last week. Okay, essentially when somebody has some type of stones, we put a little too, it's very small though. Understand, this may be a, either your, the, the ureter probably. So the basket, it actually collapses within itself, okay? And um, as soon as something hits it, it expands, and when it expands, it opens the orifices, and that's where the stones get trapped inside. Does that make sense? And then you can take that out. What's the most important element to consider after this procedure? Output. Okay, I even talked about it like, right there, always measure your urine out. <coughs> okay. Anyway, um, you want to give them uh, narcotics. What type of narcotics can we give somebody? Vicodin. Pardon? Vicodin. Vicodin, okay. That, Vicodin is to treat what, guys? Chronic or acute pain? Acute. Chronic. 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 Yeah, chronic. What do we give right now? What's going on? Yeah, morphine. morphine. So if you give somebody morphine, what are you going to be observing? Yeah, respirations. Folks, these are all elements that you guys really have to stay on top of. Why would you give anticholinergic medications? No, anticholinergic. Yeah, to stop the secretions, to stop the motility of the internal organs so it can decrease the um, pressure or the increase of the obstruction. Somebody has a suprapubic catheter, what's the number one um, issue that usually arises after 24 hours? Infection. Any surgical procedure within the first 24 hours? Bleeding. Bleeding. Okay, good. All right, now we're at hydronephrosis. We're on page, what page is this? On? 457. 
This is the dilation, folks, of the kidneys because there's fluid inside. Dilation of the renal pelvis and calluses. You folks remember what those parts are, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, pardon me? It can be unilateral, meaning what? Meaning one, uni one. Think of like univision, it's just one, uni one, one vision, I don't know. Is this still chap channel 34 on regular? Yes. I haven't had cable for a while. Um, so yeah, it could be unilateral or bilateral, meaning it could affect both kidneys. Um, obstruction of the urinary tract usually leads to this. So if you have like um, your ureteral calculi, meaning a stone inside the ureter, or down at the trigome of the bladder. I don't know if you guys remember that term, but essentially it's right in the middle of the two orifices where the ureters meet and, and transport the urine. And if they get stuck there, everything's gonna start backing up. So you're gonna have a dilation of the renal pelvis or the calluses, where the urine collects, where the kidneys collect the urine from the uh, renal tubules. Does that make sense? So clinical manifestations, you guys have to know this one, dull flank pain. Flank pain is any pain in this particular area, okay? This is what flank pain is. It's described as dull flank pain. Usually it's a slow onset. Um, why would it be a slow onset and not acute? Building up of fluids. Yeah, that's why, that's why. Uh, severe stabbing pain, sometimes they feel a sudden onset as well. Uh, nausea and vomiting frequency. Uh, dribbling, burning, and difficulty starting in uh, urination depending on where the, uh, the stricture of the, um, is at in the urinary tract. And here's a little illustration of, first of all, the bottom illustration of what ends up happening. You have some type of strong or structure or a kink, okay, as mild, moderate, and severe show. And then the renal pelvis, which is that particular area, starts to becoming really much, pretty much enlarged. And it puts pressure on the kidneys. The flank pain is that area back there, and it encompasses this whole region right here. It shows a little bit coming down here. It's very typical for women to feel that as well. But that's where it's gonna be at. That's flank pain, if you guys, you guys have to know that. Flank pain, where is it at? Um, when it comes to medications, we give antibiotics, okay, because if you have a lot of fluids building up in one particular area, it's a, it's a cesspool for bacteria. Um, again, Bactrim is an important medication. Uh, you give narcotics, you can give antispasmodics. Why would you give it? What ends up happening, folks, when you have a uh, kink is that it, it, um, it interrupts the continuity of the muscle in the ureters, right? There's muscle that causes peristalsis that helps that urine flow go down. So what ends up happening is that the muscle starts spazzing and that's really painful for the patient. So you give him antispasmodic medication so it can stop spazzing and hence it won't hurt so much. So the medications that we're gonna be, uh, that you guys have to become familiar with is uh, propantheline and belladonna. Please really know propantheline because we're gonna be talking about antispasmodics later on and this is something that you guys really have to know. Be able to identify propantheline as an anti-spasmodic. Spasmodic. And of course if this won't take care of it and there's a big kink or there's a big calculi or a big stricture or something where it's really entwisted um, within itself, we have a surgical relief, a surgery to relieve the obstruction. Or we can have a nephrectomy. Now, why would we have a, first of all, what's a nephrectomy? Mm -hmm. Removal of the, of, the, of, the, of the kidney. Now, why would we have to remove the kidney? <coughs> what was that? It's not working? Yeah, but it's not working because it's been destroyed because of all that fluid that's been pressing up inside the renal pelvis, which backs everything else up. So all the nephrons, folks, they become destroyed. The renal pyramids, the cortex, all that is destroyed because of that high pressurized fluid that's backing up. So if that happens, we have to perform a nephrectomy. You guys have to know, you guys write this stuff down because it's not on your PowerPoint. Uh, Post-op complications, in, um, if you have a patient that, that complains of acute flank pain after any type of surgical procedure, it usually indicates some type of bleeding. Okay, normally before we've talked about abdominal distension like with peritonitis, 
But for this particular patient, if there's some type of bleeding, it's not gonna leak out into the peritoneum right away. It's more in the retroperitoneal area, right? So that flank pain is gonna be very at evident. So if a patient has any type of surgical procedure, okay, and we're talking about the kidneys here in chapter 10, this is chapter 10, right? Okay, so if I ask you guys, the patient's post-op, what's the earliest indication that a patient might have some type of hemorrhaging issues? And it's gonna be acute flank pain. Okay, this indicates hemorrhaging. Also, you wanna make sure that you have a patient use an incentive spirometer post-op also, for what purpose? So that you won't, don't allow fluids to settle to you, so you can maximize lung expansion. All those elements, folks, are really important. Okay, it could be every one to two hours for the incentive spirometer, but you have to make sure that you give them the incentive spirometer. It's very important. And again, the indication for the nephrectomy is because the kidney is severely damaged. So again, what happens if I'm coming from surgery, okay, and suddenly I say, oh, I have this pain right here. It's called flank pain. What does that mean? Hemorrhaging. Yeah, some type of hemorrhaging for that particular one. What if somebody had um, a cholecystectomy? Okay. They had their gallbladder removed. Cholly, C-H-O-L-E is gallbladder, right? It, it was removed, guys, and then suddenly I develop a hardboard-like distended abdomen. What does that mean? Okay, fluid? You're retaining fluids? Okay. What is this, guys? <laughs> Not ascites. <laughs> I just came from surgery. I had a removal of my gallbladder. And then within 30 minutes, yeah, peritonitis, folks, remember? That hardboard-like abdomen, that's peritonitis. You guys remember that? Okay. What's the worst uh, thing that could happen to, a, to an abdominal ulcer? Rupture. Then you develop peritonitis, the hardboard-like abdomen. You guys, the tympanic abdomen. I just want you guys to understand, the same thing's happening. You're bleeding. But when it comes to a GI issue, it's that peritonitis. Okay, the peritoneal cavity gets full of blood, it becomes very much distended. If you have bleeding from your kidneys, it's flank, su uh, uh, sudden flank pain, acute flank pain, and that indicates some type of hemorrhage. That makes sense? Before we go to the urolithiasis, what do we give somebody to prevent, um, uh, to, re to prevent any type of atelectasis post-op? An incentive spirometer. How often? One one to two hours. Two hours. Every one to two hours. Good. We'll talk about urolithiasis and then we'll probably go to lunch. <coughs> when it comes to urolithiasis, folks, this is stones. Okay, we're talking about stones. Pardon me? Oh, this is just the stones. The stones inside the urinary tract. Renal calculi. So formation of urinary calculi or stones, yeah, it develops from, from minerals. You guys should probably know that it can be cholesterol. Okay, so somebody's diet's too high in uh, cholesterol, you may develop some type of stones. Uh, calcium and purines. You folks know what purines are? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, they're those elements, sardines, organ meats. It's a byproduct of that and usually they, 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 they develop in your body and it can develop in your kidneys as well, okay? And of course, they're identified according to the location. So if you have uh, kidney stones inside the actual kidney organ, they're called, uh, it's called nephrolithiasis. Okay, lithiasis, folks, is the actual stone, okay? It'd be, it, remember I talked about the cholecystectomy, the gallbladder removal? If I say cholelithiasis, that stone's where? In the gallbladder. So right here I'm saying nephrolithiasis inside the kidneys. Ureterolithiasis in the ure in the ureters, right? And then the cystolithiasis, it's in the bladder, okay, in the urinary bladder. So you have to just un be able to identify those folks. Cysto is bladder, okay? Mr. H, out of all those, which one's more painful? Pardon me? Out of all three of those, which one's more painful? Um, I wouldn't know which one's more painful. I would, based on the A and P. I would say it's probably the kidneys or the ureteral. 
And not because the cystolithiasis doesn't cause any pain when you're urinating, because it sometimes blocks the, your, the output to the urethra. Okay. However, when when you have this type of pain in, in those organs, it's severely painful. That flank pain, it's very debil debilitating. So that's why I would say it would be the kidney or the the ureter. Uh, clinical manifestations. You folks have to understand that you'll have flank or pelvic pain, right? Flank or pelvic pain. Um, it's also sometimes described as colicky pain. Nausea and vomiting. Hematuria, very important for you guys to know. Okay, hematuria. Blood in the urine. And sometimes, this is also not in your PowerPoint, an uneven urinary flow. Sometimes, folks, the stones, they become... Um, uh, they break down, okay, and our body flushes them out. When they're being flushed out, we usually pee them out. Sometimes they're so small we can't even see them. However, sometimes they kind of accumulate. Uh, it's like they break down, and on their way out of the meatus, they clump up together. And for male, you could really see this. The patient will complain of severe pain when they're urinating, and the flow of the urine will be how? Yeah, it'll be split because there's something in between the urine flow, so it actually goes both ways or that way, and that's usually an, uh, a clear indication that they might have some type of stone. And it comes out through the urethra. Does that make sense? Okay, it's really painful as well. So again, hematuria, very important for you guys to know for urolithiasis. You guys know why it's called urolithiasis? The umbrella term is called urolithiasis? Because it happens in the whole urinary. Yeah, okay, good. Match with the slide. Yes? All right, so again, nephrolithiasis, kidney, uh, ureterolithiasis, the, kid, uh, the ureter, and the systolithiasis inside the uh, urinary blend. That language is like in Russian or something, so. But it was the best picture. All right, so when it comes to um, stones inside the urinary tract, you want to give antibiotics. What those stones do, folks, yes. Yes. you have a question? I'll answer. No, that was me. No, yeah, that was okay. Um, why would you need antibiotics? Okay, that's very prophylactically. We do that here a lot, though. The stones can sometimes. The stones sometimes uh, cut or create fissures inside the the urinary tract, so harbor for infection. So that's why we're giving antibiotics. You want to encourage fluids. Fluids, um, uh, they flush everything out. Okay. If they dilute the solution that's causing the calculi, it may actually flush it out as well. You want to encourage the patient to ambulate. Ambulate uh, increases the uh, function of the kidneys and also positions the patient differently so hopefully the, the stone may actually be flushed out. Um, it's very important, so imperative. It's of paramount importance. Like on my big words? Okay, you guys strain all urine. Okay? It's really important that you guys strain all the urine. What does that mean? Yeah, a little strainer. Yeah. You pee through it. Yeah. So you guys remember the gold rush? People would go out the rivers and, and dig in the dirt, and the little holes would make all the fluid come out, and the gold would stand up. Well, we're looking for gold here, okay? We're looking for stones. Why do we need to keep the stone? To see if they pass the stone. To see if they pass the stone. Also, we usually send it to the lab to see if there's anything else going inside. We see what the stone's made out of, so we can tell the, the patient, you know what, you want to decrease the intake of your purines. And if there's purines that are being that are forming in the calculi, that means there's some type of other issue going on as well. So that's why we want to strain all the urine, folks. That's going to be a test question. So make sure you know it. Strain all the urine when it comes to stones. Remember how you said um, that sometimes they're so small you, you can't even see them? Yeah. Will that kind of strainer still grab it? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, surgical procedures, cystoscopy, go inside, find out what's going on in there. You can do a ureter roll lithotomy, meaning remove it from the ureters. Pyelolithotomy, where are you removing it from the pyelolithotomy? PYE, the renal pelvis. 
um, on a nephrolithotomy from the actual kidneys. You folks remember what lithotripsy is? Yes. From chapters. Okay, yeah, I, I don't have too much up there because I know I've talked about it before, but please remember that lithotripsy is a fancy word for when we have stones inside, whether it's our gallbladder or our kidneys, but in this particular case, our kidneys, right? We do sound waves. We use sound waves to uh, pass on through the patient. It passes through the skin, and it actually hits the stones, and it disintegrates them. Okay, that's what lithotripsy is. It's a procedure. It's a procedure, yeah. It's not invasive. It's not invasive. Meaning the sound, the sound waves, they put the apparatus right next to your, uh, wherever the stones are, and it, and, it, and it passes through this low, resonant sound wave. And eventually it actually breaks them down. They can put you in water for that. They can do it out just on a, a regular procedure table. But that's what lithotripsy is. You guys have to know what lithotripsy is. They use sound waves to break apart the uh, stones. Can I switch the slide? <coughs> Uh, and here's a little illustration of what ends up happening, of uh, the different procedures that I was illustrating. All right, guys, go to lunch, come back at one o'clock. Don't eat too much, you guys look like